Welcome viewers to another episode on our FPGA and embedded topics. And today we are talking about hashing. Now hashing underlies so much these days. There is variety of things like signatures, authentication, even blockchain and crypto. The example though that comes to my mind is Python dictionaries. And if you have ever wondered how the dictionaries work, they are essentially hash tables. When you're given a key, you hash it, and the hash converts that um, text or whatever input you had into a number. And the number is then um, used in this data structure called the hash table to store your actual data, which could be anything. It could be a list, it could be another um, hash table or whatever. Python's extremely, extremely flexible at, at storing. But let's not talk about the hash tables. Today we only want to focus on the hash algorithm and the one we are going to pick to show interesting property um, of Avalanche on is called the Murmur hash. Now hash is a digest for a given message that's usually hard to reverse. And there's also something called the cryptographic hash, which have, you know, almost impossible to, to reverse and, and figure out what the algorithm is. Um, but the murmur hash is not really a cryptographic algorithm. And um, in today's discussion, we will show um, an important property which relates to randomness. And this is called the avalanche property which implies that a small change in the input of the hash can lead to a very large change in the output, which is up to 50% maybe of its output bits toggling. Could be even more, but at an average, about 50% of the bits in the output will change. So um, with that introduction, let's uh, look at the um, little bit of a history of where Murmur hash came from. So Murmur Hash was created by uh, Austin Appleby in 2008, and it's uh, hosted on GitHub, um, and you can Google for it. It exists in a number of variants, like you know Murmur Hash 1, 2, and 3. We are going to use Murmur Hash 3 today in our demo. Um, but its name comes from two operations, two arithmetic operations. Uh, I shouldn't say arithmetic because rotate probably is not considered an arithmetic operation, multiply and rotate, which are used several times to create the randomness that we end up seeing. And I'd like to reiterate that don't use this for cryptographic um, functions because this is not designed um, to be difficult to reverse by an adversary. So it is not the best for cryptographic operations, but it is fairly good function for just hashing so that you get randomness in your in your hash and you can store data um, using that hash. So um, today to demonstrate all these things, we have set up a demo in which we will use the following test bed to demonstrate the avalanche property. We're gonna take some data coming from the test bed and push it into first a CRC64 function so that we can compress this data down to 64 bits. Once we have the 64 bits, we will use variants of this by changing first just using the 64 bits and then changing one of the bits of 64 bits and computing the hash each time. And then we will correlate all this amongst each other to see what happens when you change the input to what happens on the output and what is the um, bit correlation between these two. And if it indeed is a good uh, hash function, then we should see this nice avalanche property that, you know, when you change one bit on the input, about 50% of the bits should change on the output. So um, to demonstrate how I set up this demo, I'm gonna show you um, this um, main function um, and you don't have to write this down. I will provide, um, I'll provide a GitHub um, link so that you can go look at it there. Now, I have used a um, couple of things here. I have used um, the, uh, I guess, the two libraries, 
one for CRC and one for Murmur Hash. So you can see that besides just the usual stuff, I, I am incorporating those two header files here. And I have written some functions like Hamming distance, which is to see uh, among the output and the you know various outputs is to see how many bits have toggled between the base case and a case where I've changed one of the bits. Then I also have a print histogram, which can simply print the histogram based on uh, uh, like just like a textual hist histogram of the data. And then um, going further, um, this is my main function. And in the main function, I generate random data. And I have in this case generated 64 bytes of data. And then I pass this data through um, this CRC64 function. And this is from a standard library that I just showed you. And then I print the CRC. Okay. Now the CRC64 is obviously given us 64 bits of data. Now we can play with the, the data and just compute a, an, a, a murmur hash of that data. The way I do this, there's also a way to just compute ongoing for the input data itself, compute a murmur hash. But in this case, I'm just using CRC64 because that's a faster function, easier to um, implement in either an FPGA or an embedded system. Um, it's less expensive. Um, so then once I've done that, I can increase the randomness of my CRC by adding an avalanche on top of the CRC. And that's this fmix64 function. So I will do this, take my CRC 64 bit, run fmix and, and get this data. And then I will put, I will shift one of the bits or change one of the bits of this CRC 64 and then run the hash again. And then I'll compute the Hamming distance, which is from this base case, um, compute how many output bits have toggled as I've changed one input bit. So you can compute uh, how many bits toggle, and that's the Hamming distance. Now, once I have computed th that over all the individual bits of this um, CRC64, I'm done. If I, I could at this point try to change two bits and, and print those histograms, etc. But you get the picture, and you can you could spend a lot of time trying to play with the characteristics of this hash. But the important thing is this fmix function, and I'll show you in a second how I've how I've included these libraries. But then you print the histogram and you're done, right? So now let's um, first run this. So before we run this, we're gonna make it, and the make includes all the libraries that we need. You can ignore this uh, warning because I'm not really using the CPP. I'm, I'm just exposing one small function which comes from the murmurhash3.h file. It's an inline function, so I, I need none of those uh, CPP functions at all. It's very straightforward. Um, so once I've done that, if I run CRC test function that I just created, you can see that changing one bit is changing uh, almost 50% of the bits in the output. And that's the Hamming distance that we talked about earlier. Now, um, how do I set the external library? So I have this get libs, func get libs script and it'll pull in from GitHub all the right libraries and try to compile them. Now there is a problem here. In the smhasher library, uh, if you look at the source code, the um, murmur3 dot um, h file, um, it did not have this function exposed, which is fmix64 function. And we need this for our purposes. So since this is not exposed, I had to add this to the header file and expose this fmix64 function. And uh, when I did that, I had one more problem that in case it was not, this force inline was not defined, so I had to add this um, line here. And what I will do is I will put these, uh, put this header file um, also in my directory so that you can basically um, just get this header file. But at the same time, um, I want to make sure that um, I have followed all the licensing um, and copyright uh, that Murmur Hash 3 comes with. So I've not tried to change anything in this file besides just exposing this force inline um, capability and the fmix function. So I will uh, make it available 
um, to everybody who wants to play with this. But it's essentially um, the same thing as what Austin has, and it's just exposing that capability so I can use just the fmix function. I don't want to use the murmur hash functions as they're exposed here, as you can see. I want to use just the fmix function because I want to use the CRC for the base. I just want to expose the um, fmix function here. So um, that's about it. I just also want to quickly show you that um, that function that we looked at um, real quick here. You can see that we talked about the murmur, which is multiply and rotate. You can see here, there's a rotate, there's a right shift, um, and um, it's kind of, it's, it's a rotate function because we XOR it with the right shift. It um, kind, it's kind of a, a, a rotation function, right? Um, and so, um, well, not, not really, it's not quite a rotate function, but if you right shift, um, I guess you expect the lower bits to turn around. So I don't think this is really a rotate function, but whatever. Um, but you do this XOR uh, with a shift right, and then you multiply by a big constant, and then you repeat that same exercise, and then you multiply by a big constant, rotate again. So this whole multiply, rotate thing um, is is what makes up this randomness that we talked about. So you, you can take a value, you can multiply it by big numbers and rotate. And these numbers, I guess there's some um, simulation or something that has been done to make sure that these num numbers are actually uh, good to give us that entropy that we are talking about or the randomness that you're talking about. So um, that's it from this perspective. And if I, um, if I go back to my uh, folder here, I want to make sure that you can easily reproduce this. So let's just quickly look at the make file. Oops, uh, again. Um, and in this make file, we are just compiling this main.c, but um, I am using this uh, smhasher source, libcrc, and then um, basically I'm compiling this and um, I am. Actually, I'm also compiling these two files. So um, what if we take these out, right? What if we take, because I don't think we need this file. So let's see if we um, make again. And there you go, our warning is gone. So if we run again, there we go. So that fixes it. And we have um, our histogram again. All we needed was just the, uh, the functions coming from the CRC library and the header file from the SM hasher. We don't really need the CPP code from the SM hasher at all. So um, I will put this code on the uh, Bitbucket and you can grab it from there. And hopefully, you know, you should be able to reproduce this easily. Um, what I will also do is that I will copy the SM hasher source and um, murmur hash 3.h um, locally, and then I'll add it so you guys can have um, this file. And then if you change the make file here, to um, include the uh, dot folder. Just bear with me one second. Should be there any moment here. And now we don't really need the SM hasher library. So if we um, make again, and it, there it goes. So, so um, essentially, um, this is what will be available to you. Uh, you have all the files, just um, when you pull this out, run the get libs, it'll give you the libraries. You can go through the source code, they are freely available libraries on the web. You can look through the source code, it may help you out. Um, and then once you're done with that, you can obviously make this project and uh, try to run the, the hash uh, avalanche function, the histogram generator, 
and you can see how that works and how it produces a pretty good hash function. And you can play with it some more. You can try to uh, apply the same properties on CRC itself and see what kind of data you get um, and so on. See the avalanche properties of CRC as opposed to the avalanche properties of the hash function. So um, that's it for um, this episode. And um, I probably can cover an FPGA implementation because it's a multiply and um, sort of a rotate operation. Um, it's it should be fairly easy to implement a multiply, even though it takes multiple clock cycles. But remember, the way we did it was we use CRC for, for the whole data and just one step at the end. So we could compute this on lots of high-speed data because we can pipeline it. Um, and by pipelining it, we can keep processing it at very high speeds. Um, the CRC would run very high speed, and then we can pipeline the the murmur part of it so that the hash is produced in is let's say 10 or 15 extra clock cycles or some steps later so that's um that's fairly feasible so again thanks for tuning in and until next time keep learning and keep helping others and i'll see you in another episode some other time take care and bye bye